Well, good morning. How is everyone? I hope you're all well. Now, look, before we get into the meat and potatoes today, I have got to cover some breaking news. Because, look, we're all about breaking news over here. So it would appear that News Nation have had access. They've had access to outside of the fence that goes around the Idaho 4 murder house. Now, I must say that in my opinion, there are camera lenses that could have got us closer without the need to walk up to the fence and look at it through the fence. It reminded me of kind of going to the zoo and looking at the animal through the, the, the wire. And what about the security guard? 24-hour shift security guards. You had one job, Joe. You had one job. One job. And you fucked it up. Anyway, into the meat and potatoes. So today, Brian Koberger breathed in, Brian Koberger breathed out. Coming soon, News Nation. Anyway, what are we talking about today? We're talking about Stephen Smith. And the fact that even though recently it had been said that Stephen Smith's mum had said that she didn't believe that Buster was involved, it would appear that right back in 2016, she felt very, very differently. And she actually wrote a letter to the FBI with respect of what happened to her son and how she felt about it and some things that had gone on around the family after the event took place. Now, some of you may have seen this letter, and for those of you that have, it's tough now. You're going to have to watch it because of the algorithm. And if you click out, it will make YouTube think that you hate me and hate my video and I'll be punished for it. And unless you want to punish me, you're going to stick around and suffer again. Some of you won't have seen it at all. You wouldn't have known what even what I'm talking about. You're in for a treat. So we're going to watch it together. We'll read it together. Watch it together. It's not a film. It's a video. No. Letter. Here we go. Strap yourselves in. Sandra Smith, 635 Coco Drive, Barnwell, South Carolina. This is a public letter, by the way, before people turn around and say, you're doxing her, you're doxing her. No, this is in the public domain. I'm not the first person to have this letter. RE, Stephen Smith Murder Investigation. Dear sir or madam, my family is in desperate need of your help. My 19-year-old son, Stephen Nicholas Smith, was murdered on July 8, 2015 in Hampton County, South Carolina. It has been apparent from the first week of this investigation that authorities are covering up critical evidence and we no longer know who to trust. Now, I am just going to click out of here because you'll notice that my little box is very, very small. And it's due to how this has been laid out. And I know that there are people who would much rather prefer to stare at me than this letter. So for that I have to apologise. Because I'd prefer to be looking at me as well. Because I'm quite vain. Anyway. So they don't know who to trust. Stephen's father, my ex-husband who is now deceased, and I were first told that a son was shot to death after running out of gas in the early hours of the morning and exiting his vehicle. Later that day, we were told it was a hit and run. Finally, investigators determined he was beaten to death. He was attacked so violently that the entire side of his face was rebuilt with putty for his funeral. Hampton investigators asked us at that time to continue to publicly say it was a hit and run. They claimed that he didn't want the killer to know they were looking for him. There have been no named suspects. The first call my family received after the murder was from authorities notifying us of Stephen's death. The second came very quickly the same morning from solicitor Randolph Murdoch. In fact, he called my ex-husband's cell phone as we waited in the police station for a positive identification. He said he heard of the case and was interested in working pro bono as a liaison between the family and investigators. Stephen's father accepted the offer. 
although we were unsure why Mr. Murdoch wanted to help us. We also weren't sure how he found out so quickly, even before it was confirmed to be our son. So, surprisingly, after just a few interactions, Mr. Murdoch stopped returning our calls. Within days of our son's death, Stephen's twin sister Stephanie was approached multiple times by peers telling her that Salissa and Murdoch's nephews were responsible. As a family, it was suspicious to us since he had taken such an immediate interest in the case and then became unreachable so quickly. These suspicions, the suspicions reached new heights weeks later when Stephen's older brother, Chris, was approached at work by a young man he did not know. This person told Chris he was present when Stephen was murdered and witnessed everything firsthand. He said that Solicitor Murdoch's nephew, Buster Murdoch, who graduated with Stephen, beat Stephen to death with a baseball bat. He claimed it was because Stephen was gay. Stephen was, in fact, gay. The witness said that they were out smashing mailboxes when they came upon Stephen and Buster seized the opportunity. The young man told Chris that Buster threatened to kill him if he ever spoke up. This information was given to investigators, but nothing has come of it. In revealing a copy of the 911 dispatch log, which I have enclosed, tab A, page 2, I found that the first responding officer, Michael Bridges, arrived on the scene within a minute of 911's dispatch, even though in the Hampton County Sheriff's Office incident report, tab B, he claimed to have driven around for a while, trying to find my son's body. The second officer, Jason Eubanks, arrived within two minutes. This is suspicious to me because the area where my son was placed is extremely rural. Cops do not patrol that area frequently, and it's not likely an officer, much less two, would coincidentally be patrolling there prior to 5am. They had to be in that area at the time for a reason. I suspect they were there because they already knew Stephen was there, and I suspect the Murdochs were the ones who told them. The Murdochs are probably the most prominent family in Hampton County. Stephen had, on more than one occasion, mentioned to friends and his twin sister that he was involved romantically with someone from a prominent family in the county who was hiding his sexuality. He said that it would shock people to know this person was gay. We suspect this could be the young man Stephen was referring to, though he never named him. At the beginning of the investigation, officers told us that they would not have access to Stephen's text message for approximately a year. They claimed they would have to send the phone to Apple to override the security features. We found out months later the phone had never been sent to Apple. Often, investigators claimed it was uncertain which department had the phone. They have since produced the phone, which they still have not sent to Apple, but still claim they cannot access it. We feared them, and we and we and still fear now that they have and will continue to delete critical information from the phone. It has already been over a year, and we have no knowledge of who Stephen interacted with by phone, call, or text prior to his murder. Since the murder, Buster has gotten rid of his old vehicle which is critical because according to the witness who approached Chris, they were travelling in Buster's old vehicle that night. It's also critical because Stephen was found three miles from his vehicle on the morning of his murder. There was no blood splatter at the crime scene, despite his brutal beating, which makes it clear he was transported to that site. We believe there is DNA in Buster's old vehicle. I think it's important to note that Stephen's wallet was found in his own vehicle and his gas, ta his gas cap was open, further suggesting he did not leave willingly. Tab C. Stephen was very skittish and would never have walked down the road in the dark, and it's not likely he would have opened his car door to accept assistance from someone he didn't know, especially alone on a dark country road. He was even known to walk through the woods during the day to stay out of sight. 
His autopsy shows his toxicology reports were negative for drugs and alcohol, so I have no reason to believe he would have done something so completely out of character. Since Stephen play, was placed on the highway, it became a highway patrol investigation. We thought this was beneficial to Stephen, since local authorities obviously have their own agenda. However, this did not help our case at all. This case was mysteriously bounced from investigator to investigator without reasons or notification. It would repeatedly get to a certain point, then the signed investigators would bow out, perhaps not wanting to take on Solicitor Murdoch. I was approached in September 2015 by a gentleman claiming to know about a criminal case decades ago that was swept under a rug to protect a different member of the Murdoch family. This came as no surprise to me. I see history repeating itself of my son. No one here is trying to solve our case. Therefore, I contacted Governor Nikki Haley that same month with a plea for help. I wrote a letter telling her basically word for word the story I've just explained to you. She responded promptly and assigned the case to new investigators. While it appeared to be the answer to our prayers, very little progress has been made and they say they have exhausted their leads. I cannot fathom how that is possible. Our concerns regarding Solicitor Murdoch and his family have not been investigated despite witness accounts, which include an alleged conversation between a schoolmate of Buster's little brother, Paul, and school officials. I was told he claimed to have knowledge of the murder and implicated Buster as the murderer. Those school officials were said to have discussed the statement with the student's family, not police. We have heard no further follow-up to this situation. Interestingly, according to my source, Paul was transferred from the school to a private school after the alleged statement. We believe Solicitor Murdoch's influence extends to the pathologist Dr. Aaron Presnell of MUSC who performed Stephen's autopsy, Tab D, though Deputy Coroner Kelly Green and the SLED agent Brittany Burke, who were both present for the autopsy, have gone on the record to state that neither made any mention of a car striking Stephen. Dr Presnell ruled his death as a hit and run. She was combative with the Highway Department investigator Todd Proctor, asked regarding her findings when he pointed out the only trauma was to Stephen's head. He asked how she came to that conclusion, and she said it was because he was found in the road. That alone was her reason. She insisted hit and run despite the fact that neither his injuries nor the crime scene support that finding. The coroner, the coroner disagrees with her determination and it is documented multiple times in the case file that there were no skid marks or vehicle debris consistent with a hit and run at the crime scene. Tabs E, F and G. Dr Presnell herself confirmed to investigator Proctor that she found no glass or other fragments on the body to suggest hit and run. It is simply not possible that a vehicle struck solely his head. Coroner Ernie Washington informed investigator Proctor that Dr Presnell told him she would change her report and read however he wanted it. Copies of Investigator Proctor's summary, notes and documents, his discussions with Dr Presnell and Coroner Washington are enclosed. We desperately need your help. This investigation is being deliberately derailed. We need someone to hold the investigators accountable and access Stephen's phone. Solicitor Murdoch is widely known and it appears this is playing to his advantage. We need someone who doesn't care about his family name to take this case seriously. In July 2016, I wrote to Attorney General Loretta Lynch in the hopes that she could and would help us but there has been no response. I've enclosed the key documents I mentioned above, but I can provide copies of all the case documents I have at your request. We, have, we also have new information which we discovered in the past few weeks and we feel is critical to this case. However, I no longer trust the investigators here. I am holding it as I await your response. I can be reached at... I thank you immensely for your time and help. Sincerely, Sandra Smith. So there you have it. Now I think that that is pretty much a damning letter. Let me know down below what you think. And if you're about later, I'm doing a live. And I'd like to see you there. We'll discuss it again. See you all soon.